That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about France, the 11th film directed by... <laughs> Not the country. Well, kind of. Uh, the 11th film directed by Bruno Dumont, which premiered at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival in competition, uh, where it received uh, quite the divisive response. Uh, Kino Lorber is releasing it December 10th, 2021. Do I know Bruno's other films? No, I, they've been in the background. I, I remember a, over a decade ago renting 29 Palms, which I'm sure you don't remember where that couple gets kind of torn apart by that strange looking man creature in the end. Um, I, I actually think I do recall that. Okay, because like, yeah. it's like hypersexual for most of yes. it, and then all of a sudden it's like, mm -hmm. oh, oh. Uh, and then I know that I had Slack Bay on, and you asked me to turn it down because of Julia. Slack Pinochet. Bay? Yeah. That makes me think of like, uh, like if you have like a work romance and you communicate mainly via Slack, mm -hmm. that would be a Slack That's bay. a Slack Bay. No, the original title of that is Ma Loot, which is slang for my dick. Uh, but Slack Bay, you ask... Loot is penis? L-O-U-T-E. In what language? It's like a, a French slang. Oh, expletive. Anyway, you asked me to turn that down uh, because of Juliette Binoche's screaming. Well, who wants to hear that? All right. So you saw this film at Cannes, mm -hmm. and before you even returned home, you were saying this is going to be your favorite film of 2021, mm -hmm. France. And then you keep talking about it. You've mentioned it in several videos, a couple podcasts, how much you love this film. Mm -hmm. So I watched it last night. Mm -hmm. And I woke up this morning after we watched it last night to discover that I'm quoted on the Blu-ray cover. Nicholas Bell is quoted on the Blu-ray cover. Do you recall what the quote says? I mean, it's a uh, amalgamate. They picked out three words, it looks like. Do you know what those three words I are? I think it was dazzling, uh, fantastically pleasurable. I'll post it. All right. I don't know that I had those all in the same sentence. I'd have to double check. Oh, it's all about the edit. Blame mm -hmm. it on the edit. So, I watched the film last night. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to say this straight away. I would give it four out of five stars. Okay. That being said, it was not... It was hard to sit through. I had a hard time keeping my eyes open. Um, but I think the story is excellent. I And, and it does what... Like, it... it it does what it needs to do. It's just not a fun movie to watch. I disagree. I, I loved it watching it a second time. Even Yeah, I, you were sitting there giggling every five minutes. And I'm like, what is so funny? <laughs> well, because it, it's so... Bruno Dumont, who I consider to be kind of a provocateur and is doing kind of a mishmash of other things we've seen him do, is making very clear, deliberate choices yes. and doesn't give a damn whether you like them or not. I, I agree, but it's just funny how we... You're not wrong. That's how you interpreted it. I don't. I didn't think it was enjoyable, but excellent film. Okay. All right. The basic story. Mm -hmm. There's a lady named France Demur. France Demur, which means basically France is dying. She is a television journalist. The opening of the film, she's at like a junket or a press conference where the pres the actual president of France is being questioned. Emmanuel Macron. And she gets to ask a question. She's there with her personal assistant slash producer, I think. Uh, Lou, played by Blanche Jardine. And did you mention Lea Seydoux is playing French? No, Stewart? I didn't. Okay. She, Lea Seydoux, who I know from that Oxygen? No. That's Melanie Laurent. Oh. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of Americans might know Lea Seydoux from uh, the, the last two Bond movies. She's Madeline Swan, the Bond girl, uh, if you will. Uh, she's also Blue, Blue's the Warmest Color. She was in four films at Cannes this year, this being one of them. I mean, she's a big deal. She's at this press conference and she asks the president like a very tough question. Like clearly everyone's like, oh, you're, you're something else. And her line of questioning goes viral. Mm -hmm. She's already popular and on TV, but this really like steps her up a notch. Um, but the film is kind of doing a lot of things because that's happening. Then we see that she's in a marriage that is not great and has a kid who doesn't really like her. Then we see her hit a motorcyclist and injure him barely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she becomes very invested in this person and wanting to help he and his family. Then 
the stress of work causes her to... Well, it's that incident that kind of causes this unraveling. Like, suddenly, she, suddenly she's examining her life in a different way. So she ends up quitting her TV job and goes to, like, a wellness retreat. Mm -hmm. And it's at this retreat she meets a guy mm -hmm. named something. He At the retreat, he pretends he doesn't know her, even though she's, like, a big deal. Mm -hmm. Which is a red flag that he's playing her, and he is. He is a journalist doing like a story on her. So he's pretended, so we think, to fall in love with her to get this story, which gets published. She's devastated because she feels misled, obviously. But that also encourages her to kind of want to get back into the game. Mm -hmm. So we see her get back on TV. Part of her gig is she does these like bullshit like puff pieces where she's like in the field like you know with like some isis of uh, uh people like th these people fighting isis sure yeah and then like in the middle east yeah in the middle east somewhere and then we see her with like some refugees on a boat or something but it's all fake like she's just trying to get it's good, all... it, she doesn't care about these people or their story she's just trying to get a, a good visual so towards the end after she decides to get back on tv her and her producer are talking shit about these clips, like how, oh, great, like just, like, just talking shit, like, clearly they don't care about the story, they just want a good piece, and they don't realize that their microphones are live, so, like, the nation is listening to her talk shit. So now she's back in trouble. Then, her husband and her kid get into a car accident, mm -hmm. in a very melodramatic uh, scene, mm -hmm. and die. Mm -hmm. And then she decides to, she transitions from that to like wanting to be a more like sort of integrous journalist. Mm -hmm. And she does this interview and the lady says something to her, which makes her think that she might want to give old boy Catfish a chance. Mm -hmm. And she does the end. Yeah, there you go. That's very, the, uh, on the surface, that's what the story is about. But I think the movie is very surface. It is. It, it's about trying to go deeper where maybe there's no depth to be had. Yeah. I have no notes because I, well, had a hard time staying awake. But also, I think it is about sort of the banality of life and how none of this shit matters. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, and I think while the film was hard to sit through and not an enjoyable experience, I think that the story is excellent. I really related to it. I think... Like, Leia Seydoux as this character is not captivating, but I don't think she's supposed to be. I think she's supposed to be like a blank slate. Well, yeah, she makes a comment that there, it's very pointed that she's, somebody asked her if she's left or right wing, and she said, I'm, I'm neither, why does it matter? Like, I want to be transparent, she keeps saying. She wants right. to be this kind of, you know, tabula rasa, if you will. But then, you know, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything, which is kind of what happens. And in almost every scene, she's brought to tears, especially after this accident with Baptiste. A character refers to her as useful but pretty. Which upsets her. Which really upsets yeah. her. Yeah. Um, but everything around... She finds that everything around her is false or not authentic. No one's there. Lou uh, is not really there to support her. Her husband could care less about her. It, there's an even something... There's implications that he might even be cheating on her. Um, the, her kid wants nothing to do with her. And then, of course, the final blow is this man she meets at this, this retreat that is, you know, was posing as a lover to get a story. Uh, and and sh she just unravels. And I think she's worn down by the kind of the, the tediousness of this fake um, life she's living. We're going to do a top 10 favorites of 2021. Mm -hmm. So this will be your number one. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, since you love it so much and I don't have any notes, why don't you just go through your notes and explain to us why this movie is a masterpiece. Because I like it. No, I... Uh... <laughs> You also uh, like Spam, okay? No. <laughs> I don't even remember the last time I ate Spam. You were saying you wanted Spam. And like, for the other day, And the other day you ate Chef Boyardee, like... <laughs> it was half off. We're not going to do this. Go ahead. <laughs> um, where to begin? I, I really... Because it was half off. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this? Um, I like... So, during one of her... Uh, what do you call them? Her, her exposés, her investigative reports that she's doing that are basically all staged uh, for to showcase herself. Uh, she's talking about these um, 
men in the Middle East as victims of their own regime, which to me, I came away, especially watching this the second time, she's a victim of her own regime, which is media and capitalism. And she's, she's really just kind of ground down to nothing. And I think all of these teary sequences, which I know have been referred to as crocodile tears uh, in other areas, uh, I think that this is genuine for her because she's mourning her, her, own, her own death, like, her, she's naive to a degree thinking that she can kind of dip in and out of actual humanity whenever she wants, which you can't do. Well, I mean, and then a good example of that is like when she hits this guy, Baptiste, on his little moped, who appears to be like special needs or like a vulnerable adult, and he lives with his older parents. Um, she's very fixated on like wanting to assist him. It's like she feels pity yeah, and then she has a line where she says... I didn't realize the consequences. Because he supports the family. Right, but, so but, but, but the line I was going to say is she says, I've never given to charity so I can someday give to someone I know. Yes. But well, it's ironic because she doesn't know these people. And, right. and we realize as she after she writes them a big check... You know, she's leaving and the people are kind of like fake smiling and talking under their breath like, wait till she leaves. C clearly, like, they were just... Like, they were expecting something from her, and they were only being nice to her to get something. And then her doing that is supposed to make her feel good, but it really means nothing. Right. And, but she keeps giving them more and more money, because I think that uh, that's what gets her transported to this, you know, sanitarium, if you will, because she's given them $40,000 at the end of the day, I think, in conversation with her husband. Um, but I, it explains why she, she's completely open and vulnerable, if you will, because um, uh, we watched this with a friend and the, the lover comes back and hops in her car and it's like, why, why did she let him in her car? Because she's, she's completely open. Just like she's, she thinks she has to allow everybody sit, that wants to take a picture of her, she allows them to and has to do all these autographs. And you see that switch at the end where she finally stops trying to do that as she's you know, kind of trying to change. But it's almost too late. Uh, the, I feel like the final shot of the film is where for one moment where have a close-up of her where she's not crying and she's kind of blinking her eyes like she's just shutting herself she's she's allowed to be enveloped in her own fake reality and not really looking at the world anymore i think um and also to me this is very much packaged like a 1940s studio melodrama uh, a, a women's picture if you will the kind of things that used to feature like betty davis and joe crawford and barbara stanwyck uh, and about how these women who these working women who are consumed by their careers um which I very much liked, and it, and it kind of cuts corners, and which all are very deliberate choices. Like, we don't really see the romance. We just see that they met, she's in love, she meets him, he betrays her. Or one of the best scenes to me in the film is this accident with her husband, which is shot very much like, um, it reminded me of the opening of Kubrick's The Shining. Okay. With the driving. Mm -hmm. um, and that extended uh, car crash scene that is so over the top that you can't help but laugh. And I think... I laugh a lot in this film because I like films that are uncomfortable. Um, and the, to me, this is a film that is uh, wanting us to sit in our discomfort of how everything is, uh, how we're all banal, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, which doesn't make for an enjoyable viewing experience, in my opinion. Oh, see, I disagree. I, I love it. But, you know, I, I think I, I recognize that this is um, very good filmmaking. And I think, again, the story's excellent. I think people... It's interesting because when people boo at a movie like this, I think it's because they don't like having a mirror brought, like, shown to them. Right. That, that's really not mincing words, uh, as it were. Uh, I read a headline today saying that the film is inscrutable. It's like, I really... I don't think this film is inscrutable at all. I think it's very clear with what it's doing and what it's trying I don't think to I know what... I don't know what I think inscrutable means. <laughs> You keep going. I'm going to look it up. Uh, Impossible also, to understand. Oh, see, I think it's very clear exactly, what's exactly, happening. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's also the last score. I think people don't like it because everyone wants to attach meaning to something. But the reality is how I look at it is when we look at celebrity and notable people, politicians, what have you. So like France Demur, whatever her name is, like 
she's somebody. Mm -hmm. She's a notable person. And even her shit doesn't matter. And still unhappy. And still unhappy. So it's like, well, someone like me who's a nobody, if, if I weren't aware of the fact that I'm nobody and my life means nothing but to a few people, I would probably be mad at this movie too. Like, <laughs> but sure. I'm more self-aware. Go ahead. I, I lost my train of thought. Go through your little notes. Um, I like that she keeps saying that she's uncomfortable about... Uh, the looks other people give, and there's so many close-ups on her, much kind of like what Joseph von Sternberg we used to do with Dietrich. It feels like Dumont's in love with her, but he's not. He's kind of punishing her, it feels like, because this character is saying she's uncomfortable with the gaze of others, and that we're basically, we're almost like down her throat. Okay. She does more crying in this than Sally Field in Soap Dish, if you remember that film. Um, what? Oh, it's the last score of Kristoff, uh, who was... Uh, Big in the 70s uh, composer, he did, uh, who's kind of brought about in a resurgence thanks to Quentin Tarantino's use of The Sunny Road to Salinas in Kill Bill Volume 2. Uh, but Bruno Dumont has uh, worked with him a couple times, including in his last film before this, Joan of Arc, but he died in 2020, so this is his last um, score. And I think the score is a p kind of a character as well. It has these like high pitched crying sounds at moments. Uh, and then when it's not doing that, it reminded very, very much of Battle of Menti, which also lends the film kind of a, a David Lynch feel uh, that I really liked. Um, oh, and there's the scene where she's at the benefit and that man is talking about how if you're rich, you have to die. What is it? To die well, one must die poor. Yeah. I thought we had talked about it at length after the film ended, but... Yeah, I don't remember, but I but I remember thinking that was a good line. <laughs> you know, it's just this movie's so interesting because I don't think th there's a lot to talk about and unpack, but I don't think in relation to the film, I think it just conjures up these ideas of self worth and purpose and like all these things. So for that reason, I think it's a great movie, but I this was not an enjoyable experience. Um, and I think if a person is interested in watching this movie, you need to be in the mood. I think I was to, not in the mood. You need to be in the mood. And, and I think if you are familiar with Bruno Dumont, uh, you, you'll see a lot of familiar tics. Like with Baptiste and his family, you know, you've seen representations of uh, characters like this, uh, people living on the periphery uh, that are often are odd or very striking looking on screen. Uh, Seydoux is kind of given the reins in a way that Dumont did with Juliette Binoche and Camille Claudel, uh, 1915. Uh, so again, it's kind of a mishmash of his usual elements, but in a way that's kind of delirious to me. Uh, and maybe, and you know, people don't like that. With the press screening I was at at Cannes, there were lots of boos, and I was hoping they were going to give Seydu a Best Actress Award for it, be a little daring, but of course the jury was not. Uh, but I think a lot of people which is why I'm quoted on the DVD cover, is a lot of people disagree with my sentiments about the film. Uh, although it is on John Waters. I don't think this is like, I don't think her performance is like an award-winning performance. Oh, I think it's great. All those scenes where she has to cry at, at, uh, like that, it's impressive. I mean, so does every reality uh, show contestant, but okay. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's the other thing I was trying to say earlier, is that it doesn't... What's frustrating about it is really no matter what she does, there, there is no effect, at least that we're seeing. When she, I love, I love all the cutaways to something going on and then her on her show where she has that blown out hair. It looks a little Oh, like I do want to comment on her hair because obviously it's terrible, but I think it's perfect for her because she's one of those people who is like a natural brunette and she sees herself as a blonde and it's bad blonde. But it, like it, like it almost defines her. Like people with that kind of hair, it's like their color defines them. And I think that was perfect for her character. So I think how she played the character is spot on, and it works very well. I just don't know that it took a lot to to get there. Oh, see, I, just, I, I think it's I, the direction and the screenwriting that's the real star of the movie. I think her performance has a lot to do with the success of it because I do like it. Obviously, I'm a stranger to this kind of universe, but I did have empathy for her as this person who everywhere i don't know I, I don't no matter where a person is in their life i don't see how you can have empathy for seeing how where everywhere they turn there's really no one there that's got their back yeah i had empathy for the idea of it so i think the story is very strong but and her performance is very appropriate i just don't know that it's like 
to me, when I think like an award-winning performance, it's like they put a lot of work into it. I think the writing and the direction did all the work. And this, you know, blank-faced lady with bad hair just kind of goes through the scenes because she's not doing anything. She's not blank-faced at all in this. I feel like she's very flat except when she's crying. But Which I, is a lot. But I think that that's what her character should be doing. Like, sure. she's... like. None of this means anything. Well, that, so that's very effective. So, again, yes, nothing means anything. She quits this high-profile job, and even the speech she prefer, prepares is so underwhelming, they have to, like, just have silence on the television, <laughs> on the program. And then and then she leaves, and then she comes back, and then she there's this major uh, mess-up that's very a face in the crowd, right, when Andy Griffith is exposed in the end. Um, and again, that has no... It, and to me, that reminded me very much of what it felt like in the U.S. under Trump, uh, no matter oh, what, we don't no, get comments now. Well, I don't care. It was insane. That's because like, you don't have to deal with the comments. <laughs> Go ahead. Just, it didn't matter what kind of scandal was happening. They, you know, it didn't matter. There was no. I think a good word is underwhelming. Like she did a very good job. Like the way this character was written. Like she's supposed to be that way. But like I've said in many reviews. As effective and excellent as this storytelling is, watching a character like that is very unsatisfying to someone like me. Like, if I knew this bitch in real life, I wouldn't like her either. Like, she's she has this, like, sort of self-imposed importance when really it's like nothing matters and you're no different from anyone else. You got your heart broken, someone took your money, like, you left your job and no one cared. Like, you're just like everyone else, but I think that's the story and it, it's very well done. Yes. You know, what I recommend it, if you're in the mood and you know who this director is, I didn't. And the only reason I watched it was because you kept talking about it. And, you know, like many things, it's hit or miss because our tastes aren't very similar. But, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's an excellent movie. I think there are profound moments, such as when she does allow this lover to come back and uh, saying that, you know, all the cruel twists of fate that life has thrown her, you know, she's like, there are real monsters. And I think at the end of the day, that that's what it is. But also that maybe France is dying. <laughs> and the the uh, husband's name, played, played by Benjamin Bailey, who's a composer and actor, is Fred Demur, which means Fred is dying, or Fred Fred's dying, which he does. Um, yeah, I just love that scene. Anyway, the, to me, this, this film is a lot of fun, and the, I like kind of a push towards uh, forcing a re-examination after a viewing rather than being spoon-fed, I guess. And I, I think that Bruno Dumont, I never expect him to do that, so that wasn't surprising. I was kind of shocked at how um, the disdain, the general disdain people had for this film coming out of Cannes. But it was, as I was saying, on John Waters' uh, 10 Best of the Year as well. But that's all I have to say. And I would give it, and I did give it, four and a half out of five. All right, bye.